Ted asked me to preach on a sermon called Watchful Servants. Watchful Servants. And it's going to be taken out of Mark chapter 13 and then Luke 12. So if you would take your Bibles or your uh, pew Bibles there, we're going to go to Mark 13. Not quite yet, but we're going to go there uh, very soon. But I looked at the, the words watchful servants and pertaining to what we're going to be studying in, in the Bible today, in God's Word, I looked up what does watchful mean. And watchful means to be alert or vigilant. And then I looked up servants. What's a servant? It means to be a devoted or helper or a follower or supporter of someone else. So we are watchful servants, or we should be, of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So I'll be speaking this morning on being a vigilant or alert, a follower or supporter of Jesus Christ. And we're going to be going to Mark 13 and Luke 12, as, other verses, as well as other verses in the, in the Bible. But first I want to say something. Many pastors and teachers nowadays are preaching that Jesus is going to come soon. We know that he's going to come soon. What we don't know is how soon. They're looking at things, movements and actions in the Middle East with Iran and Iraq and Syria and Russia and countries like that, amongst others. And of course, Israel. Very important. God's people is Israel. But no one can give a date or a time when Jesus will come again. He's going to come for his church. We are his church. We, Christians, are his church. There are no secret messages in the Bible, or history for that matter, that can answer this question of when Jesus will return for his bride. That bride is us. We are Christ's bride. So I want to ask, are you prepared at this time for Jesus to come? We know it's going to happen, whether today, tomorrow, a hundred years from now. We know it's going to, be, to happen. What I want you to do now is turn to Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13, and we're going to read verses 3 through 11. Mark 13, 3 through 11. It says in verse 3, As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are all about, that they are all about to be fulfilled? And Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. And then verse 9, he says, you must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. Now, it's very difficult in our country here, the United States of America, it's very difficult for us to say, where is all this happening? We're not, we're not dealing with these things yet. Yes, we are. We are dealing with them, but in a lower tense. And plus, it's not supposed to be just America. It's the whole world. And what do you see that's going on in places like China, in North Korea, in many of the Islamic states? You see problems. You see Christians being killed, persecuted in all kinds of various ways. Their finances taken from them, and so on and so forth. God has been good to this country, has been good to us. And I'm afraid as time goes on, you could see the pews getting emptier and emptier and emptier. And you could see it out in the world, how things are changing so much uh, that maybe Christ is getting ready to come. But going on, let's look at verse 10 now. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. 
Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Now you know that if you're born again Christian, the Holy Spirit lives within you. And he will give you the words to speak, the words to say, if you let him and you ask him, he will do it. Now I want you to hold your fingers there. We're going to come back to Mark 13 in just a little bit. But prior to these verses that we just read, the religious leaders were firing questions at Jesus, trying to get him to blaspheme God uh, or to give wrong answers pertaining to the Jewish law and things like that. Questions pertaining to paying taxes, uh, the resurrection, about the greatest commandment. But they couldn't get Jesus to answer wrongly. But Jesus turned and warns those who are listening to him. He says, beware to the teachers of the law and their hypocrisy. As he says in verse 9, you must be on your guard. So I'm asking now, how is your spiritual life? Are you growing in your spiritual life or are you standing still? You should not be standing still, period. You should be growing. And we're going to go into that growing part. What is really important in your life? I want you to think about this. What's really important in your life? What should really be important in your life, though, is the kingdom of God before everything else. It's hard to do when we have little babies and wives and husbands and things like that. But God is first in our lives. He wants us to make him first in our lives. Now, you've been holding your finger there in Mark 13. I want to go over to Mark 13, verse 32. Now, Jesus is telling about, the, about being uh, watchful and things like that. Verse 32, he says, But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with, his, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, Jesus continues, therefore keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. We're not talking literally sleeping here. We're talking, do not let him catch you in sin or to be totally unaware that Jesus exists. Those kind of things. So as Christians, our responsibility is to remain watchful pure in heart, and ready for his return. Again, no one knows when he'll come back. Keep watching for the signs of the world. You know, we keep seeing a lot of floods and hurricanes and things like that. Well, he just mentioned all that in, in chapter 13. Things are going to be happening in the world, and there seems to be more and more and more of it. So we're getting closer, obviously, as every day it goes by, we're getting closer to Jesus' return. So we need to be growing in our faith and the expectation, the expectation of Christ's return. And I'm going to hit that word expectation a little bit later on in this sermon. It's very important for us. So how do we remain watchful? How do we remain pure? And how do we remain ready? I want you to turn to 2 Peter. It's after Hebrews and uh, that near the end of the New Testament. We're going to go to 2 Peter, verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 3 to 11. Chapter 1, verses 3 to 11. 2 Peter. He says, and this is Peter speaking, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, God's word. 
gives you all of those promises. Having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness mutual affection and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in, in increasing measure, that means growing. You're growing in your spiritual walk with God. They will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Verse 10. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. And you will receive a rich, you should underline that word, you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So this is what the commentary in my NIV Bible says. I'm going to read what the writer here says on verse 10, reference to that. He says, Peter wanted to rouse the complacent believers who had listened to the false teachers and believed that because salvation is not based on good deeds, they could live any way they wanted. Notice the word complacent, because they were living complacent lives. They weren't doing anything religiously. They weren't doing anything for God. They might show up in church on a Sunday and then not do anything else. So he's saying that's what Peter was trying to straighten out. If you truly, he says, goes on, he says, if you truly belong to the Lord, Peter wrote, your hard work will prove it. If you are the Lord's and your hard work backs up your claim to be chosen by God, you will be able to resist the lure of false teaching or glamorous sin. And then he says, what does your life say about your faith? So, so how do we add these things to our lives? How do we add goodness? How do we add knowledge? How do we add self-control? How do we add perseverance, godliness, and love? How do we add these to our, to our lives? We get them by reading and studying the Bible. God gave us it. He expects us to use it. So let me show you what the Bible says about a few of these things. You can write these down. You don't have to turn to them. In John chapter 17, verse 17, John 17, verse 17, it says, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is the truth. The Bible is the source of truth. The Bible is the source of our truth. Luke chapter 11, verse 28 says, Blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. That's Luke 28, verse I mean, Luke 11, verse 28. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. So the Bible is the source of God's blessing when it's obeyed. God blesses us when we obey his word. Moving up to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. Ephesians 6, 17. It says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So the Bible is the source of victory for us. And 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. 1 Peter 2, verse 2 says, I love this one. Like newborn babies crave spiritual milk. Spiritual milk is God's word. He's telling us that. Crave this. Like newborn babies crave spiritual milk, which is God's word. So by it, you may grow up in your salvation. I talked about growing in your faith. Grow up in your salvation. You're not going to get it any other way. The Holy Spirit will work in your life, but he's going to work through the Bible. So the Bible is our source of growth. So far, we've got the Bible is our source of truth. We get blessed when we obey the Bible. The Bible is our source of victory. The Bible is our source of growth 
Now, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first the Jew, then the Gentile. I want to read that again. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first the Jew, then the Gentile. So the Bible is the source of our power. How do we get our power? From reading God's word. And then the last one, I have Psalm 119, 105. Psalm 119, verse 105, it says, Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. A light on my path. So the Bible is the source of guidance for us. How are you going to know what God wants in your life if you don't read his word? Our response to the Bible should be to believe it, to honor it, to love it, to obey it, to guard it, to fight for it, to preach it, and to study it. These are the things we have to do to stay alert and watchful, waiting for Christ's return. Now, I want you to go to the second reading for this morning, which is in Luke. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, uh, verse 35. Luke 12, verse 35. It says, Jesus is speaking now. He says, be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning. Like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly I tell you, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night or toward daybreak. Now, who's he talking about? The master. The master is Jesus Christ when he returns. And we are his children. We are the church. 39 says, But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. So Jesus is telling his, his disciples that there is no time for complacency in their lives. There's no time for us to sit back. No time for sitting back and taking a vacation from God. Have you ever done that? Have you ever just taken a vacation from God? Even when we literally go on a vacation to the beach or whatever, it doesn't mean you have to run to the first local church. But what it means is don't remove God from your heart for that week or how many days. Worship him, praise him, read his word, pray to him. So don't take a vacation for God, from God, not even for a second. A good servant is to be constantly waiting, constantly waiting for the master. Now, lamps in those days, back in Jesus' time, burned oil. And you had to make sure the oil wasn't running out. So the walkway or the path had to be lit up for the servant's master when he approached the house. There could have been severe consequences for those servants if they didn't light that path so the, so the master could see. In a Roman household, if, if the servants didn't obey what the master wanted, tough luck for them. They should have done what he wanted. Well, that's what Jesus is saying to us. He's saying, expect him. Watch for him. Jesus may come at any time, and we have to be prepared. We have to be prepared for him. It's not the time to relax and cut back, but a time for renewed vigilance. It's a time for renewed effort. It's a time for renewed investment of our energy as we prepare for his coming. 
we need to be telling other people about Jesus Christ and what he has done in our lives. You don't have to teach Sunday school or anything like that. Just live your life for God, and he'll do the rest. Live your life for Christ, and he will do the rest. He'll take control of you. The master shouldn't have to bang on the door. Now, I want to say, can you imagine you're sitting in your house, Jesus is coming back, you're not, not knowing when he's coming, it's the farthest thing from your mind, and there he is banging on your door. He doesn't want to do that. He doesn't want to be banging on the door, waiting for you to come around to come and open the door for him. When he comes, it's going to be in an instant, in a flash. So when the master arrives, the servants are to be ready. His coming is their most important priority. Now I want you to go back to verse 37. And notice what's happening here. In verse 37 it reads, It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly I tell you, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. This is a role reversal. Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. But what's he going to do? When he comes back, he's going to wait on us. That wedding feast we will be having with him because we are his bride when we enter the kingdom with him. It's a wedding feast, and he will prepare himself to serve us. Do you remember in John chapter 13, verses 14 through, uh, 4 through 17, how Jesus washed the feet of his disciples, a role reversal. He was showing them that we're all no better than anyone else. Each one of us should serve the other. Now in verses 39 and 40, these verses give the parable of a thief breaking into the house in the middle of the night. The owner of the house has to be awake so he can hear the thief coming. They said in those days, it, it was more like they would chip, the, if a thief was coming, he would chip a hole in the, in the wall of the house to get himself in. Because it's made of dirt and things like that. But Jesus in the same way will come again. He'll come when no one's anticipating him and no one's expecting him. So we need to be in full anticipation of Jesus Christ coming. And the only way you can be ready for his coming is to stay spiritually awake and spiritually alert. Is there anything in your life that can destroy our readiness for Christ? Yes. Sin in our lives will destroy our readiness for Jesus Christ. We know something isn't pleasing to the Lord, but we continue to do it. We think that God will forgive us. Yes, he will forgive you. He will forgive you. But there's more to it. He will forgive you of your sin. But we allow that sin to prevent us from walking closely with Christ. Remember, we've talked other times in here, and we've done it in our our. our other groups and Sunday school and things and life groups, we talked about the Holy Spirit. How Peter talked about being filled with the Holy Spirit. But he also talked about grieving the Holy Spirit. How easy it is for us through our sin to grieve the Holy Spirit. You do not want to do this. You do not want to grieve the Spirit. So don't let the devil have an influence on your spiritual walk with God, with God, with Jesus Christ. Do not let the devil have an influence on you. If you're under the assumption that Jesus will not come in your lifetime, then you, need, then you are extremely vulnerable to his coming when you don't expect it. You're being very vulnerable to someone else shattering your faith. What a horrible thing that will do to shatter your faith. Are you ready for his return? Now, I have one last little bit on verses. In 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, 
verses 6 to 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. Now this is Paul speaking or writing. But he writes, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. So he's getting ready to leave this world. I have fought the good fight. What's the good fight? The good fight was him following what God wanted him to do. And where did he learn this? From God, from Jesus. He goes on, I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Are you keeping your faith even through the hardships? I don't know of anyone in this room that doesn't have trials in their, heart, in their lives. I do too, just like everyone else. We have to keep the faith. They help us to grow in our faith. Verse 8, now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness. One of the most important things that you'll receive when you enter heaven, if, I'm going to say if, going back to that. Now there is this in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all. Every one of you that expects Jesus' return, every one of you will get that crown of righteousness because that's what you have to do for that. There'll be other crowns, but this is the crown of righteousness. And not only to me, but also to all, as it says in the end there, who have longed for his appearing. Who have longed for his appearing. Now it goes on to say in the commentary of my Bible, as he neared the end of his life, Paul could confidently say that he had been faithful to his call. Thus he faced death calmly. He faced death calmly, knowing that he would be rewarded by Christ. The good news is that the heavenly reward is not just for giants of the faith, like Paul, like Peter, like John, and so on and so forth. But it's for all who are eagerly looking forward to Jesus' second coming. We should be looking up into the east every day and saying, come, Lord Jesus, because that's where he's coming. Is your life preparing you for death? Worldly death. You will have life forevermore with Christ if you believe in Jesus. Do you share Paul's confident expectation of meeting Christ? I do. Every day I pray for him to come. Would you like to receive that crown of righteousness. That crown of righteousness. If you want to receive that, then I suggest you look up to the east with those expectant eyes and heart looking up for Jesus to return. Because there's no doubt, no doubt, he is coming. We just don't know when. So be prepared for him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you, dear God, for your word. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. And I pray, dear God, that we won't grieve the Holy Spirit in our lives. I pray, Father, that we will grow in our love and in our faith. And it will be a continuous growth. And I pray, Father, for all these people in this congregation now, if they do anything from this moment on, I pray that they will pray to you, Father, and read the word, even if it's just a little bit every day. Go with them and their families. In Jesus' glorious name, amen.